Hello and welcome to Smith and Sheridan on Biotechnology, a podcast on the science and business of biotechnology, presented by me, Cormac Sheridan. And me, Andy Smith. Hello, everyone. Hello, Cormac. How are you? I'm good, Andy. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. This week, we're going to talk about a condition that you really wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy, short bowel syndrome. And it's called a syndrome, but it's a condition that can arise for any number of reasons. Usually occurs to adults, and it usually involves that they've had some sort of surgery to remove large sections of their small intestine. It can happen in infants who are born with some rare genital conditions or who develop a really horrendous condition called necrotizing enterocolitis, which can result in severe inflammation and then bacterial infection as well of the intestine. But it really arises in adults who have to undergo bowel surgery because of very severe inflammatory bowel disease or maybe some form of gastrointestinal or colon cancer. So it's highly variable because different sections of the small intestine, which is very, very long, three to five meters is the sort of standard kind of given. It does vary in people because of height and other factors. But obviously it depends on how much of the intestine is gone, where it's gone, which regions are affected, and also what level, if any, function is remaining because it's the function not necessarily the amount of intestine that you have that's important. It's extraordinary, actually, how much of your small intestine you can lose without actually compromising function in any severe way. Because short bowel syndrome, I think, with intestinal failure is defined as having a small intestine of less than 200 centimeters, which is absolutely extraordinary, given that's less than a tenth of the original organ. But obviously, patients who are affected are very badly affected because they just can't absorb nutrients or water during the normal intestinal digestive process. Therefore, they typically need external nutrition to be administered intravenously. So there have been very few drug approvals in this area. I mean, way back when, about 20 years ago, Serono, if you remember them, part of the German Merck, um, they, they got an approval for Zorbtiv for somatropin, a recombinant human growth hormone, and a company called Nutritional Restart Pharmaceutical got an approval in, in 2004 for formulation of L-glutamine, which was administered in combination with somatropin. But really, the sort of modern story starts in 2012 in terms of FDA approvals. That's when MPS Pharmaceuticals, subsequently acquired by Shire and subsequently acquired by Takeda, but NPS originally got the approval for teduglutide or GATEX, a glucagon-like peptide 2 agonist. And that kind of has sort of set the bar that other companies have been aiming at since, right? Yeah. And chief among them being Zealand Pharmaceuticals with their GLP2 analog glepaglutide, and maybe from a news perspective, most relevant at the moment, Ironwood Pharmaceuticals. Mm. Another GLP2 agonist called glutide. They reported phase three data recently. What was your take on their data? Well, it's, let's go to full disclosure purposes. So I go back to MPS Pharmaceuticals when I was an investor in a company, <laughs> when it was a private company, I believe, because the fund I held had it in there. So I go back to that stage and Gatex really... Sorry, in terms of disclosures, do you need to tell us that you made a ton of money on this or not? Uh, well, <laughs> I own shares in the company I ran, I managed it. So I got some benefit from it. Yeah. But I mean, it, it's all in the midst of time. <laughs> Even bread is soon forgotten, eh? <laughs> no, actually, yeah. I was going to say, I'll probably Probably drunk it all now already so uh, <laughs> continuing <laughs> yeah. so uh, i go back to that stage and gatex as the product already approved when shire bought it was it was a small part of my investment proposition at the time of mps pharmaceuticals i think it was actually on napara which was an analog of a an hormone for hypoparathyroidism and ironically now in Takeda's hands that has not done particularly well for various reasons so gatex is the sort of the, the remaining product and as you say Cormac, it's about to go generic in the us which complicates the iron wood 
issue, but it didn't complicate the announcement. So the announcement, recent announcement, I would stars clinical study had them seeing stars. Oi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the announcement was a positive phase three clinical study and the share price tanked. And I always like to look at that point because so what are investors, do what investors know that I don't and what are they reading into it? And as it turns out, it was quite a lot. There are three references to what we've sort of discussed before and cross trial comparisons. And for those not aware, where one company runs a clinical trial, Let's just say for the argument's sake, it's against placebo. And they look at the efficacy data either on its own or against placebo, or in this case, both cases from baseline of the placebo patients and the active patients. And in Ironwood's case, they look to see how their drug reduced the volume of parental nutrition that the patients require. And I mean, reading the results and the description of the patients, again, I felt for these patients, right? And many, as you say, many of these patients have had like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. I spent many years in abject pain, resulting in a large part of necrosis in their small bowel and having that surgically removed. And then having to get then large part of their nutrition from an IV injection every day, liters of it. Listeners may have looked at the announcement or seen the study, and it's a GLP-2 analog, which might be thought of if you were a bit dyslexic. I mean, as the drug of the moment, right? The skinny jabs, but it's not there. The GLP-1 agonists, although I believe you... They're cut from the same genetic cloth. They both actually are encoded on the same gene. Yeah. And they're both cleaved out of it in some sort of a post-translational peptide processing process. So GLP-2 supposedly promotes intestinal adaptation in patients with short bowel syndrome. Yeah. It's a kind of a compensatory process to improve intestinal function. Basically, it acts kind of in a sort of a growth-promoting fashion, I suppose. And the GLP-1, or what we're we calling them a GLP now, GLP-1 receptor antagonists, you've identified, I think there is one that was trialed in short bowel syndrome. And you can sort of see why, you know, because yeah. if it's to stop or to promote absorption yeah. or to stop and via having less intake, you can sort of see why that might affect SBS patients. But I don't think it's being progressed. And, you know, the, the heritage, if you like, of modern pharmaceutical treatment of uh, short bowel syndrome is in the GLP-2s, which GATEX is the first case, and, and the Ironwoods drug is the latest one. So the announcement was positive. The share price reaction was, I think they called it in the trade, it cratered. Yeah, they're, they're down about 15 bucks and change before the announcement, and they're now almost nine bucks. So they lost about six out of 15. That's a fairly hefty decline. <laughs> That's off. a crater. Yeah. For a drug that hit its primary endpoint and hit yeah. two of four key secondary endpoints. So that immediately got me yeah. interested. So why are investors going the other way? Why are investors don't think it's positive yeah. as the company does? And I mean, before we get into the nitty gritty on that, I'd like us to explore this cross trial comparison aspect where one company does a, a clinical study, let's say it's against placebo, it achieves a positive result and it refers to another study done by a different company with a different molecule, not their own as you know, we've had a discussion about head to head studies. So we've got two different, let's say, placebo controlled studies, that of GATEX years ago and that of Ironwood's apoglutide. And there were in the, either in the study announcement or on the conference call, it was peppered with cross-trial comparisons and why people typically don't like cross-trial comparisons. I mean, I have to say, at the end of the day, it might be all you have, right? Because very few companies conduct a head-to-head -head study just because the risks are you might ask a question you not like the answer to. And yeah, and because that But let me say, just to cut in there... I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for companies who try to avoid the inevitable by scientific obfuscation. I mean, given the length of time that tetraglutide has been on the market, to me, it beggars belief that the FDA didn't demand a head to head trial. And uh, that's because the FDA's traditional gold standard is a placebo controlled study. And you, you can sort of see how, you know, some reasons that the physicians would say, well, in some patients, it's not ethical to do a placebo trial. Well, I mean, it's not ethical to do a placebo trial. That's on right, the... yeah. On the one side, yeah. No, on, on, yeah. The, on the other, it's hmm. often very difficult to conduct a head-to-head -head study because you've got to get the other product. 
you've got to overlabel it or repackage it or perhaps even reformulate it into something that looks like plain white tablet. And is that possible at all? Yeah. So it's double blinded. And they're also then doubly expensive. The answer is it is. Now, it is bloody expensive. Gatix costs about $300,000 a year. At the moment, yeah. Yeah, which is a huge amount of money for an easy manufactured peptide drug. So there is that consideration too, to be fair, if they can't readily get access. I presume, I don't know whether they can just make it themselves because they're not selling it. No, they can't. If you're going to do a head-to-head study, you need the registered product to do it against. You can't make it yourself. But The other complication is that Apiglutide is a once weekly drug. and that Exactly. Is- I was going to get onto it. So how do you blind that? Well, you give patients two sets of injections. One is a white labeled, labeled A that they have to give once a day. And you get the other injection is once a week. It's not ideal. And you can sort of see which one's the active and which one's the placebo just on a dosing. Well, you'd almost have to give people on active drug the placebo every day to fully blind it, um, yeah, yeah, which yeah. isn't easily done either. So, okay, we'll give them a pass maybe on not doing a head to head, but are we giving them a pass on the big question? The leadership team on the call, CEO Tom McCourt and CMO, Chief Medical Officer Mike Schetzlin, I mean, they were saying, you know, we're thrilled, et cetera, et cetera, positive trial. And they maintain that this drug has the potential to do over a billion dollars a year in net peak sales. The, I think, no, I mean, look, Ironwood still has a valuation north of a billion dollars. And they do have a healthy revenue stream right now from their chief existing product, which probably is going to go generic quite soon too. Yeah, yeah, that's, 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 that's a big worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they still, you know, they, they do serious revenues. They have $440 odd million, I think, last year were there as of a drug that has blockbuster status. So they brought a blockbuster drug to market with Abvi, and, you know, so they're, they're a capable company. But they think that they have a billion dollar seller on their hands. Now, I do think they have a drug that's approvable. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And once weekly versus once daily, you know, it's an incremental improvement. But I don't think it represents any kind of a massive clinical breakthrough for patients, or maybe I'm wrong. Well, certainly against GATEX on the primary endpoint, that's probably responsible for 30% of the share price fall because, you know, if you're up against a product that's going to be generic in a year or so, and your primary endpoint is not significantly within the bounds of cross-trial comparisons, obviously, different from that product, then you haven't really got that much. What else have you got that's that's going to promote the use of that product? Well, I would, would then say, well, as you said, quite, it's a once weekly product, whereas you have to inject it once a day. Now, you know, I have a bugbear because I've worked in payer market research and I've had payers tell me that we don't pay for convenience. If there was a, a safety or an efficacy advantage, that might swing something. But if one drug does the same as the other drug, even if a drug has to take it seven times as often in a week than the other drug, then that's not payer's problem. That's either the carer, uh, yeah, and I feel for these patients as well, the last thing they want is another injection. But if an injection every day stops you having an, a massive IV line for loads of volume, then you worry less about whether it's once weekly or once daily, particularly as soon as you're not paying for the drug and the payers are saying for the drug. So I can sort of see everyone's points except Ironwood's. And I would love, in these situations, as we talked about with Ironwood and we talked about with uh, our Island. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall when the results get unblinded at these studies. And it's not exactly what they wanted. In this case, primary endpoint doesn't look better between cross trial comparison between GATEX. And the disappointment, I guess, and the throwing things around is probably quite different to the narrative on the announcement and the conference call. But yeah. you're given lemons, you have to make lemonade. But you know, the share price is telling us that certainly against what will be generic GATEX, they may not even have lemonade on that compliance aspect. But another source of the disappointment was it also missed some key secondary endpoints Mm, 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 mm. in patients that are milder. The colon incontinuity group, as they're called. And these represent, I mean, they did, the trial recruited roughly 50-50. There's two main categories of patients. Yeah. Those are the stoma, which is this basically an artificial opening. Yeah. 
in the abdomen to which the colon is diverted and the fecal matter is collected in a pouch. So they're able to kind of establish a differentiation between placebo there, but there was a treatment effect that was evident. There wasn't any massive difference between the placebo and the active treatment arm in either of the two secondary endpoints for the patients categorized as colon and con continuity, which means that they have either fully or partially intact colon, by the way. And, um, and therefore less requirement for parental inter intervention yes. or parental nutrition. And therefore they're probably the more mild patients. So, you know, we probably reached a point, but as you say, Cormac, that, that's half the patients. So, the patients. And that's a good point because that's the patient group that kind of, I think, isn't best reached by the current therapies because exactly. yeah. they are less sick to begin with. And at the same time, they do have a medical need, obviously. But a very interesting endpoint to me of the two secondaries, and Ironwood on their call were careful to point out that they had four secondary endpoints yeah. and they're listed in order of importance. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and this one was the fourth, but I actually think it's actually a very interesting endpoint because it's called reaching enteral autonomy at week 48 in the colon in continuity patient subgroup. Mm -hmm. Enteral autonomy, I'm assuming, means a sort of a functional cure. And the epiglutide group, 12.5% of them achieved that secondary endpoint, but 7.4% of those in the placebo group did. So the treatment effect it was positive 5.1%, but it was not statistically significant. Because if they had a big delta there between the active and control arms, you have a very interesting proposition on your hands. Then. You do, but I mean, this was a 163 patient study. That's so right. you've got to think when you split the study by groups, by yeah. subset, CIC or, or incontinent or, or stroma patients, you start stroma. to <laughs> stoma patients, yeah. you start to get the numbers are tiny one yeah. or two patients that needed more or less nutrition to swing the statistical significance and therefore make that insignificant. And it's strange, isn't it? The doubling of the size of this opportunity for, for Ironwood might have depended on just one or two patients. The, the response yeah. is, again, interesting mm -hmm. to be the fly in the wall when they looked at that and starting throwing paper clips and around. And yet it's that this was the largest ever phase three trial in the short bowel syndrome indication. Yeah, and that's another problem with rare disease studies, right, Cormac? Because you, you've got to find the patients. There aren't that many patients. And then does that make the statistics less or more reliable? Probably not. But also it might make, and getting back to another point of earlier, it might make cross-trial comparisons mm -hmm. between mm -hmm. different molecules difficult in small patient studies you think of primary care drugs it's tens of thousands of patients in a study and the COVID-19 vaccines that was more than tens of thousands of patients in the clinical studies but we're down to 168 here not just that 163 patients in Ironwood study but then you've got the GATEX one, which was done a number of years ago. I imagine it was far fewer patients than that at the time. So you're comparing a small group against another small group. And the reason why people don't like cross-trial comparisons is because their criteria at inclusion might be slightly different. They try and match it between the placebo and the active arms. But you can't say that the same patient was involved in the same studies 10 years apart when the disease has moved on and the diagnosis and done by different companies. So that's another reason why generally you don't like to do cross-trial comparisons. But there were cross-trial comparisons in the study. And, and I think the Ironwood CEO said, uh, well, you know, OK, so we didn't show statistically significant difference in CIC patients, but nothing's worked in CIC patients. So that's sort of a cross-trial comparison. Fair enough. OK, just because we didn't show efficacy and no one shows efficacy, all that means is you're not going to have double the market rather yeah. that you thought you were going to have. Just like uh, anyone in fact, else. Maybe, maybe that's the most valid type of cross trial comparison you can make. It didn't work for us either. And then we have Zealand Pharmaceuticals. I mean, they're slightly ahead of Ironwood in that they've already filed their new drug application. They did so in December. Again, though, I, I think that they're within similar boundaries in terms of efficacy. I, I don't think there's a huge difference. And they tried once weekly dosing, That's didn't correct. they, and had a failure. Twice weekly, yeah, exactly. So they've gone to twice weekly dosing. But again, I can see a whistled old payer in a Medicare or, or a Medicaid reimbursement office saying, uh, well, that's for the patient to decide if they want to pay for that convenience. But if we give mm -hmm. them the same effective mm -hmm. therapy, 
and we're paying for it, you get the one state. Here's an interesting proposition. I found it very hard when I was doing my usual kind of literature searches and all the rest of it to find a whole lot about any other drug targets that are in development. I mean, yeah. nine meters yeah. of biopharma went into chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in July last year, or at least they filed to enter it last July. They have been developing a GLP-1 agonist, uralenatide, and that showed some sort of level of efficacy in a phase two trial. Um, the measure there was just reducing the amount of stool output from patients. And they actually, compared to placebo, they actually had a large treatment effect, but obviously they weren't able to raise enough cash. It wasn't deemed sufficiently interesting, I presume, by investors to further back the company. So I, I don't know. And, and yeah. I can see their point, though, because if you have a novel GLP-1 mm -hmm. receptor agonist and the, what, something that the SBS, something like 18,000 yeah. right. patients in the three major markets. Fair enough. As you've pointed out, Cormac, you could sell it for a reasonably high price until you start to get generic GATEX on the market. And, and then that's going to hurt that. So you have a choice, right? Because mm -hmm. everyone's resource limited. Do you do that in a, I admit, it's a high unmet clinical need? rare disease of SBS, where there's a very high price for a small number of patients? Or do you look at what the rest of the world is looking at in terms of GLP-1 agonists and think, oh, there's quite bigger markets in obesity and diabetes with GLP-1 agonists. Why are you doing that? That's what I imagine investors said. But the other company that I, I thought had a, an interesting scientific rationale is a South Korean company called Hanmi Pharmaceutical. And they're in phase two with a drug currently called HM15912. They have a GLP2 agonist. It's chemically conjugated with constant region of the human immunoglobulin um, or antibody. And yeah. it's administered once per month. And their hypothesis yeah. is that by having a more constant, because the, the native peptide gets flushed out really quickly. It's got a very, very short residence time. But they're saying in patients with short bowel syndrome that you get this, if you have a constant presence of that drug, you get improved intestinal growth and absorption capacity potentially. They've shown that at least in a, a rat model of short bowel syndrome. And I, mm -hmm. at least there's some interesting thinking going on there. Now, I know that the adaptation phase, that, that there is this extraordinary response to bowel resection that the organ itself or a series of organs or the tissue, whatever you want to call it, it does adapt to try to maintain its function following yeah. the section. Yeah. And this adaptation phase, there's various arguments about how long it lasts for, but it can last for months or maybe a couple of years even. I'm not sure. But if these hormones play a role in that, by having them more constantly present in the small intestine, you might be getting some long-term adaptation effects that could actually really help patients. It's a shot in the dark. You could argue that there's more hope than expectation attached to that. The published rat data, I've not seen any. It does data. resonate with me more than you would probably expect it to, just because, you know, humans... We don't produce things for normal metabolism or normal function. We don't produce things in bursts, right? We produce our well, insulin is produced. Oh, well, that's an insulin is a bad example, right? Yes. Because there's a basal level insulin and there's an upgraded insulin. But everything else, you know, we, we have a normal function and you have the hormones produced in a constant rate. Hemoglobin is another thing that's produced in a constant rate over a period of time, unless there's some external stimulus or some need for that. So I can sort of see how the small bowel would adapt to a percolation if you like, or a baseline secretion of a hormone. And that will be better than giving it as a drug treatment once a day or even once weekly. So it does resonate with me, but it's all going to come down to the same issues as Ironwood had at the end of the day. How good are you going to be against the generic competition by that time? Because another error of cross-trial comparisons is taking phase one or phase two data and saying, well, this is just as good as a phase three data but from a competitive molecule. Well, no, show us the phase three data from your molecule yeah. and we'll then compare it. Or perhaps as you would say, Cormac, show yeah. us it in a head-to-head -head study and then we'll be happy. But I can sort of see yeah. how it could be better. But if it's going to make mm. commercial traction, it needs to yeah. be shown to be better. And I know I am getting the reputation now for being a head to head head banger, but <laughs> it might well be that it'll be real world data, which will sort of provide a more valid comparison between these drugs. 
that's a really interesting point because the companies or the entities who are most incentivized to do a head-to-head study, let's just say there isn't a difference or it doesn't turn out to be a difference between GATEX and Ironwood's molecule. But the companies most incentivized to do that are companies that will produce the biosimilar GATEX. And typically, you know, biosimilar companies and generics companies, they're very narrow margin companies. You're not going to do a head-to-head study if you can get away with it. You're used to doing the minimum amount placebo-controlled study or at least not even a placebo-controlled study. You're just using your study, your molecule, and showing bioequivalence. They're just doing basic PK and stuff. The pair is doing observational real-world data studies you know, with thousands of patients. And those studies don't tend to get the same sort of uh, attention or prestige as, say, placebo-controlled clinical trials that get published in the New England Journal of Medicine. But maybe they are the best we have to go on if we're trying to draw any inferences. There was a recent report by the IQVIA Institute Mm -hmm. that I looked through, And of course, they're well connected in the CRO basis. So they are seeing and expecting more real world data studies to be conducted 2024 to 2026. And the reason why they're doing that is because at the end of the day, for once, Cormac, you and payers (laughs) are aligned. They want to see the comparative data. Good. Well, I, 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 as you can see, I'm speechless. I pity the payers. It's the prices they pay that make me scratch my head at times. So it's funny with this Ironwood story, I feel it's kind of, we're dangling. We don't have any hard and fast conclusions to draw other than, yep, it's an approvable drug. Is it going to be commercially successful? Really not sure. And also, though, there's no evidence as yet of any biosimilar tetraglutides arriving on the market. At least one publication said that it was going off patent in the US in March 2023. Mm. I've seen some references from Takeda saying that they have some sort of FDA orange book patent protection up to 2025. So I'm not fully clear about that. But it strikes me, though, that Ironwood is coming very late into the product life cycle of an established drug with offering minimal incremental innovation they are offering some there's no doubt about that but it's Mm. not exactly sort of terribly exciting really is it no and i have two take-home messages for that but firstly when you make an acquisition of a company and this is where the ironwood made the acquisition of another company Um, do not skimp (laughs) on the due diligence and do not skimp on the commercial due diligence. So you got to hope that they would have done a market model that would have included the entry of biosimilar GATEX. I'm hmm. wondering whether hmm. they did or not. And the other take-home message is that once you start to develop a drug, and I've used the term the, in the past, the super tanker effect, you know, yeah. it has its own momentum. And it's very yeah. difficult to stop regardless of what comes onto the market. So if you haven't identified that generic or biosimilar competition, your super tanker is not going to be able to be stopped until the end of phase three, at which point you're competing against I think that's actually a very good point, that a thing takes on its own momentum and it's impossible to stop. And next minute you're shoving dollars down a deep hole. Yeah, it's a good point. Mm -hmm. Um, So, well, it's not going to take too long to learn whether that's the case with Ironwood or not. No, it is interesting that we've seen we, when we talked about our nylum before that you know, they're going to be up against a generic competitor with Pfizer's drug in a couple of years time. So this super tanker effect or this inability and you can sort of see why drug development is fraught with lots of risks. It's not an easy thing to do. And you do need people in the process, either in project management or in senior management, who can bully mm-hmm. these products along. Because there are always accountants and investors saying, no, don't spend the money on that drug, do it on something else. So they do need their own life, but sometimes it doesn't work out to be ending other direction. This ends up. So you're saying you got to have faith, but faith alone isn't enough. Yeah. Do your due diligence. Yeah. Okay. Until the next time, Andy. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye, everyone.